Hello Kingdom citizens, welcome back. My name is Denzel Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. And today we have a very special guest by the name of Todd. I reached out to this gentleman a few months back. We're currently recording in December of 2021. So this video will likely get reposted in 2022. And um, I am super excited to bring this gentleman on. We're going to be analyzing whole life insurance, cash value life insurance, infinite banking concept, pros and cons, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between, uh, so that you, the viewer, can really make an educated decision where you get to see both sides, not just a hardcore uh, a life insurance agent pushing a certain product, and also not just a hardcore anti, you know, person that's bringing, uh, presenting, you know, whole life insurance, IUL or term, whatever that may be. We get to bring both people together um, where we can have a very constructive debate, uh, dialogue, conversation, and we're both going to learn new things. Uh, so I'm super excited. And with that being said, I'd like to bring Todd onto the screen here. How you doing, my friend? Hey, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much for saying yes. Uh, I will tell you, in the world of collaboration, it can be uh, of quite difficult to get access to people uh, like yourself and others that you know have you know very large followings and maybe opposing opinions. So it's always nice to to really unify. Uh, come together, uh, agree to disagree, but also agree on the very basic things of human life, conversation, dialogue. We don't have to bash each other and we can get our points across very ethically. And this could be a very, very huge learning advantage, learning curve for young entrepreneurs, young business owners that are just starting out in the creator economy, the gig economy, the social media environment. Here is a, a framework beyond the topic that we're covering, but here's a great framework on how you can conduct yourself and reach out and make some fantastic relationships. So with that being said, I'd like to give you the floor, Todd. Give us a little background with my audience, just so you know who's watching. Our majority people between the ages of 30 to 55 years old, that's my biggest demographic. You are talking to mostly single moms, divorced moms, widowed moms, uh, housewives, moms in general, um, married American families, household, mom and dad, uh, kids, people that are making anywhere between as low as 30, 40 K a month, a year, I'm sorry, 30, 40 K a year to as high as 150,000, maybe 200,000 couple of multiple six figure and seven figure earners. So with that being said, Please give us a, a, a nice background where you're coming from, what you do, and tell us about your YouTube channel as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, that was a great introduction, by the way. Um, well, as he mentioned, uh, my name is Todd Baldwin. Um, I also have a finance YouTube channel. If anyone is curious, it's just my name, just Todd Baldwin. And um, I like what you said in the beginning, and I will echo that here. You and I can disagree on something and still be friendly. And um, I'll, I'll also fully admit, um, I too am a licensed life insurance agent. Um, I, I personally, I've sold life insurance in the past and um, I, you know, I have a life insurance policy myself. I don't particularly love whole life, but we can get into that. But um, you asked me for my background. Um, so I'll give you sort of the abridged version because I want to be respectful of your time today. But um, I have, unfortunately, one of the oldest stories in the book. And that is, um, I was raised by a single mother. We were incredibly poor. We grew up in poverty. My father, I mean, I, I grew up in a house where my father punched my mother in the face and he was a child abuser and a wife beater and all the things, right? So eventually he went to jail um, and, and rightfully so. My mom finally escaped that. The problem is um, when, after he went to jail, she found out that he was not making the house payments. So we lost the house and nearly ended up homeless. And by some miracle, um, we were able to find a teeny tiny little rental. And after that, I sort of wanted to go off and make millions of dollars. I got my first job when I was 12 years old, literally shoveling horse poop for $3 an hour. I started my first business at 15. And fast forward a little bit later, 
I started working in the commercial insurance industry. So my clients are all businesses. So I don't sell like individual policies unless it's for like the CEO of a company where it's going to be a really big policy. But most of it is like the employee's health insurance or the employee's life policy. Um, all the money that I made from insurance, I dumped that into real estate. So I started a real estate company and I um, have now since left my insurance job. So now I am full time real estate investor, full time entrepreneur and content creator. I no longer work in the insurance industry, but that's how I got my start. Wow. I, I think uh, between my audience and myself, um, we're, we're probably going to connect really well because uh, we, we both have similar upbringings as well. I was also raised single mom. My father uh, was not an abuser, but he was convicted of a crime that he didn't commit, ended up serving about uh, anywhere from about 11 years, 10 years in prison and was released um, because he was innocent. And so, you know, growing up without a dad can be very difficult without a, you know, a father, fatherly role, especially for men in the 21st century today. That's something we lack is, is mentors. You know, you can't spell the word mentor without men. So it's very, very uh, uh, interesting times that we live in. And I think, you know, part of our past experiences, our circumstances, it's very interesting what drives us into different directions. Um, I will say for, for me, what drove me into the insurance industry is the, the idea of protection. And I didn't have that as much growing up. I had a lot of fear. Uh, one of the very first actions that I did when I got access to money, in your case, shoveling dirt poop, in my case, shoveling snow and washing cars um, and just helping the neighborhood out any way I can. One of the very first actions was saving the money, protecting it, because I knew that my mom would eventually need it to pay for groceries, gas bill, electric bill, even part of rent, whatever it may be. And this is a six year old kid doing this at the time between the ages of six and 13, any money, nickels, dimes, quarters on the floor, whatever it was, I never spent it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's very interesting uh, that you share that. And so give us a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit more about your YouTube channel, where you're at today, what you primarily focus on. You know, you say you're a real estate investor. So just want to give a little bit more detail so that my audience kind of knows what they're getting into when they go check out your channel. <clears throat> sure, absolutely. Um, and yeah, we're very similar. Same thing. I don't spend any money pretty much ever. I'm just saving all that stuff. But um, yeah, so, you know, I am, despite my tough upbringing today, I am so blessed. Um, I will fully admit because of my sort of investing strategy, um, I became a multimillionaire in my 20s. I'm 29 now and I can retire. I never have to work again. Um, you know, just for my investments, they produce six figures a year and I can literally just sit back and just collect that. So that is awesome. So my YouTube channel isn't so much about retiring early because similar to you, some of my audience, um, you know, is maybe a decade or so older than me, right. but it's about reaching financial independence. And um, again, I mean, I'm, I'm licensed to sell life insurance and I have a term policy myself. I think perhaps where you and I differ is that I have, I have never found a life insurance policy. I'll back up a second. I think of insurance as insurance. I don't think of it as an investment. So with that sort of through that lens, I've never found a life insurance policy, be it whole life or universal life, um, that I thought was a better financial decision than perhaps going into stocks or real estate. So like, again, I have a term policy um, because I do want that protection. Um, it is incredibly cheap. I have a $5 million term policy. So if something happens to me, my wife is more than taken care of. And she is now. We don't even really need it at this point. Mm -hmm. But I, I've just found in my own personal life, and everyone's different. Everyone's in different positions because not everyone can buy real estate. Not everyone wants to buy stocks. But for me, um, I am so happy that I did exactly what I did. And um, the name of the game for me, honestly, was was real estate. And now I, I have a, I think my stock portfolio, I have about a million, 1.3 million in stocks today. Um, most of my portfolio is in real estate. And um, it's been 
I mean, it's just it's just stupid how much money you can make in real estate. And that's why I'm such a big fan of it. So um, I'm here to spread the good word of buying properties to people and um, helping them understand that you don't need to be a crazy kajillionaire in order to afford pro properties um, because there are programs for first time home buyers. You don't have to, you know, bet the whole farm on something like you can get in with the program. That's what I did for my first one. So I'm, I'm here to spread the word. Perfect. Perfect. So with that being said, let's dive into the, the meat and potatoes. I like what you said so far, and I honestly agree with a lot of what you said, almost everything. Actually, what you said so far, I agree with it totally. So what I'd like to do uh, regarding whole life insurance, uh, just give me your definition of it and then the all of the negatives that you see with it and also give me your experience just either working with other insurance agents uh, what you were taught as an insurance agent under an agency like your time there if you were you know if you worked with like a, a, a broker kind of like a primerica or maybe was it like a wfg or a php type of model or was it like an independent agency kind of give us that background i just want to kind of see where exactly you're coming from so I'm able to kind of respond in a very uh, educated manner uh, and give value to our audience here. So, and I'm gonna sure. you know, turn to the board uh, while you talk and I'm gonna take some notes as well. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so I don't necessarily think there are any cons with, with whole life. And I, I put that in air quotes. Um, I, I think that there are other products out there that are that are better in my opinion. Um, so, and I'll just say, so for, for me, um, and for anyone who doesn't know, term life is basically you buy insurance for a specific term. Um, a very common term is 30 years. I think I bought one when I was 22. I bought a $5 million term life in, uh, policy and it expires when I'm 52. So um, you pay into it. And of course you're hoping that you don't die. And, um, but if you don't, all that premium is gone. Where whole life, there is a guaranteed death benefit um, so like even after the 30 year term, it's, you know, usually you get it when you turn hundred or when you die, but there's not a specific term. The difference is the monthly premium on whole life can typically be a lot more expensive than on term life. So as you mentioned, I think in the beginning, um, or maybe it was when we were off air, I don't remember, but Dave Ramsey preaches, you know, buy term life and invest the difference. Mm -hmm. I don't even know that, um, that I go so far as to say that. I just can speak to my own experience. So I'll give you an example. I started my career at American Family Insurance, and then I moved on to an insurance brokerage company where I was doing the business to business sales. Um, at American Family Insurance, I had the opportunity to buy a whole life insurance policy. Um, I believe, and I don't, I don't have the exact documents in front of me because this was, this was, I mean, over a decade ago now. I believe I had the option of buying a whole life policy where what I pay into it is $25,000 and the benefit that I received to it is a hundred grand. Um, so that would be like um, the face value. And I get that either, or my, my family gets it when I die or I get it when I turn a hundred. Um, and I believe at the time I was probably 20 or so. Um, and I believe that's what it was. I paid $25,000 into it over maybe a 10 year period or so. And then I get $100,000 when I turned 100. So here's sort of my dilemma. And this isn't a knock on whole life insurance. It's not It's not a knock on whole life agents. Um, again, I'm licensed to sell insurance. Um, the down payment to my first house was $19,000. Okay, so I, I had a first time home buyer program where I put three and a half percent down. I was able to buy a $500,000 house with a $19,000 down payment. So less than that $25,000 um, cost to my hundred thousand dollar whole life policy. My girlfriend and I, at the time we occupied the master bedroom at this house, and then we rented out the other bedrooms to offset our mortgage. So then we were living for free in our $500,000 house off of a $19,000 down payment. When we moved out of that house, we rented out the room that we had just left. And we also rented out the den that I was using as an office. So now we have this house full of different roommates, right? That are paying us rent which produced um, $2,000 per month in positive cash flow. We held on to that house for five years. So we made about $100,000 in profit, which was the face value of that life insurance policy that I would have gotten when I was 100 
Instead, I got it when I was, you know, 28 as far as my actual profit. Plus, I got to live there for about a year and a half. Last month, we sold the house for $875,000. So again, we bought it for 500 grand. We only put $19,000 down. We didn't have to pay any monthly cost because our roommates offset the mortgage. Then we made a hundred grand in profit from the uh, the rentals once we once we left it. That was our profit over the five years. And then we sold it for $387,000 more than what we bought for it. So in other words, we basically made about 475 grand, almost half a million bucks in profit that we made that we didn't have to pay taxes on. Um, be, because and I'll, I can speak to that later if you want. Yeah. Because of one nineteen thousand dollar investment, where had I taken that nineteen thousand dollars plus six more thousand to buy that whole life policy, I would have gotten a hundred grand. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, I would have gotten a hundred thousand when I was a hundred years old, instead of getting half a million dollars when I was twenty eight. So that's sort of how I look at it. And again, it's not to say that whole life is a bad product. It's that for me as an investor, as an entrepreneur. I found better alternatives for that money that made me 5x the return and it saved me 70 years of time to get that return. Right, to get that 100,000 from the from the whole life you got it at age 29, right, in advance. Yeah, and it was more like 500 cuz if you if right. you uh, measure out the profit from the rent and the profit from the sale. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So what I'm hearing um was the 25,000, is that a one pay? Or was that, you know, you have to pay annually 25K? Um, yeah, so I think, um, no, no, no. It was you You pay $25,000 and then it's done. And then you have the $100,000 benefit. I think, um, I, I think if I remember correctly, and again, this is a few years ago, but I believe that that $25,000 payment could be broken up over a couple of years. I don't think you had yeah. to write the check all at once today, okay. but yeah, that's what it was. So in essence, it was a definitely a, a shorter pay kind of pay up type of a policy where it's like maybe a two pay, three pay, four pay, something to that nature. Um, but let's just say it was a one pay. And if I'm understanding correctly, you let's say you paid it 25,000 for a hundred thousand dollar death benefit. Does the death benefit stay level? at 100 grand until death um, or does that can that death benefit potentially go up during the lifespan do you know um if i recall it it builds a cash value but it doesn't exceed the face amount for this specific policy with american family and again i'm this is from memory from like yeah. seven years ago or something like that yeah. but um I, if i remember correctly one hundred thousand dollars was the max benefit and that's either my family gets paid it when i die or i get that check when i turn 100 years old got it got it yeah so a couple things that i want to first target is policy design and i think i want i would argue roughly 90 percent or more probably 90 95 percent of whole life insurance policies are typically designed incorrectly by the insurance agent simply because of either lack of knowledge. Um, I've kind of usually broke it down to a few things, either lack of knowledge, they don't know what they don't know, or they do know what the potential of the product is, but they choose not to explain it to the client simply because of commission, right? And I. And I think you have an idea of this and I'll just show the audience what I mean by that. When, when we write term life insurance, it's literally a one time commission and you're done, right? As long as they keep the policy in force, the insurance agent will retain that initial commission. But with a whole life insurance policy, when an insurance agent sells a whole life, right? They receive a commission off the premium dollars, right? Which is majority of their commission. And then a PUA component, which is the cash value. PUA standing for paid up additions. This is usually only like maybe two, maybe 3% of the dollar amount that goes into cash value. The uh, agent will receive like a two to 3% commission in the first year, and then a residual commission for the next 10 years on average, if I'm not mistaken, right? So if someone has a, a premium out of that 25K, let's let's say the um, typically agents will, uh, especially on a one pay, 
typically they'll have the premium either upwards of 40 to maybe 50% of the dollar amount going in is, is typically how they design policy. So let's go with the higher number, 50%. So your base premium was probably somewhere around 12,500 and could very well have been higher, but let's just say it was 12,500. An insurance agent will, uh, depending on what his or her rank is in the brokerage or acting as an independent agent. So let's just say they're an independent agent and they're working directly with the insurance company. And you said it was American uh, National Life? Was that the- I believe it was American Family Insurance. American Family Insurance. So let's say it's American Family Insurance, you're an independent agent, um, and that agent writes a policy for the client, AKA you in that sense. He will receive, let's just say he has a, uh, a, a contract of 100% with that company, meaning they're gonna receive 100% commission based off whatever the base premium is. So they literally get a check for $12,500, right? And then the other $12,500, they're gonna receive say 2%, so $250, right? On top of the 1250, just for writing you that one pay policy. And you might have a starting cash value of maybe, so we'll just say starting cash value somewhere in the neighborhood of probably like 10 or 11 K. So this is where people get uh, the customer get confused. They're like, wait a minute. I put 25 K in principle, but then I only got 10 to 11 thousand to actually work with. And this money is going to grow tax free, which is, you know, the, the, the sales pitch that we get, you know, uh, they, that they throw at us is the idea that the, the money's going to grow tax free compounded forever which is true. Um, the issue is they say, well, in order to get access to that money, you have to either do a loan or a withdrawal. Problem is if you withdraw the money from your cash value, you're no longer going to earn that tax-free compounded rate of return, those guaranteed dividends, uh, in the policy. If you do a loan, the problem is, well, the insurance company is going to charge me say anywhere between five and 6% uh interest rate to borrow my own money meanwhile the money is going to be earning a rate of return in the policy similar to whatever the interest rate is on the the loan itself problem with that is usually the first one to five years you are running a negative rate of return when you look at what's called the irr the internal rate of return, not the average rate of return of the policy, but the internal rate of return is typically in the first year, upwards of negative 18, 25, in your case, this is negative 50%, right? Um, of, of money you, you just put in 25, you literally have 10. So you, you lost 50% or more of your, of your money that you can't access. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna eventually get that money back in this type of a design, probably 13 to 15 years later, right? So that is a huge red flag for me, huge issue, um, and also leads to a very, very poor, uh, I would say, experience of the product itself because this has to do with policy design, right? Now, what I want to share with, with you and the audience is a different policy design, same exact product, just different policy design. And we can do something like same amount of money going in, or, or it doesn't really matter how much money is going into the, into the policy. It's all about policy design. So that's the first thing that I want to really stress on during our time here today is policy design. And the second thing that you said earlier was whole life insurance is not an investment. According to the IRS tax code, that is very true. Um, the IRS treats whole life insurance as an, as an as, as an, uh, a non-taxable event where if the policy owner, uh, the insured dies, the death benefit proceedings go to the, the heirs completely tax free. And um, to my understanding, the reason for that is because whole life insurance has been around longer than the IRS tax code uh, was initially introduced to the American people. Right. So 
agree with you on that. With that being said, if whole life insurance is not an investment, my question to you, is it fair to say that if whole life insurance is not an investment, then we, we shouldn't be comparing uh, an investment to a whole life insurance product. Would, would you agree with that with that statement? I think what I would say, if we if we set aside the word investment and we set aside the word insurance, I like to use the words financial products. Okay. So when so for example, I have term life insurance because I think that term life insurance is a good financial product. I do not have whole life insurance because I do not think that whole life insurance, at least in my experience, is a good financial product when compared to other things that I could put my money into. So, and this this goes for anything. I mean, that $25,000 down payment on my property, right? For example, I could have also spent $25,000 on a car, which wouldn't have been an investment. So you could argue that that's not a fair comparison because the mm -hmm. car is going to depreciate in value and not produce a cash flow. Mm -hmm. But what I look at it, I look at it as the opportunity costs and where do I want my money to go? And so that's the way I look at it. Okay. So financial products. So with, with that, I'll go back to my statement and I'll just say from, from my own uh, understanding that if whole life insurance is not an investment because it's not taxable, um, if used properly, cannot be taxed. So therefore it does not belong in the investment categories with stocks, cryptos, index funds, syndications, real estates, co-ventures, small business. I completely separate that thinking and I also separate my dollars, right? So I'll ask you this, um, when you make money, um, you have expenses and then once your expenses are taken care of for the month, you have a, a free cash flow, money left over, discretionary income, money that doesn't go anywhere until you de deploy that money yourself. And you can either invest it or save it, right? Or do nothing, right? And typically doing nothing mm -hmm. is kind of like saving. So would you say that saving is different from investing? I would say in most circumstances, after you have an emergency fund, saving doesn't even make sense that it should be invested. And I and I, I will say one thing to, to clarify and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I wanna make sure I'm not putting words in your mouth. I think you mentioned that the reason why whole life insurance wouldn't be considered an investment is because the benefit isn't taxable. Is that, do I have that understanding correctly? That and then the way the IRS um, language and the legalese, how they look at the financial product itself. Got it, okay. So then the only thing that I will speak to that is um, similar to you, you mentioned policy design, the, the way you buy real estate can also be untaxable. So what I mean by that is so like I live in a duplex right now. Okay. I spent $900,000 on this duplex. That's not what I spent. That's what it cost. My down payment was significantly lower than that. Mm -hmm. Today, this duplex is worth $1.4 million. And this was just two years ago that I bought it. So I've made about half a million dollars in appreciation on this duplex in just two years. When I go to sell this house, if I sell it for $1.4 million, the tax liability on my half a million dollars will be zero. And it's because there is an IRS tax exclusion that says that if you live in a primary residence, which is where you live, it's where your home is, and you're a married person, then you can sell that house up to a $500,000 gain with no tax. If you're single, it can be up to a $250,000 gain with no tax. Similarly, because I have a depreciation schedule on my real estate, meaning I can depreciate the property over time. That's why I love real estate because it goes up in value, but mm -hmm. for tax purposes, I can say it's depreciating going down in value. I can collect my rental income and pay no taxes legally. So that's how a guy like Robert Kiyosaki pays no taxes. That's right. how, and uh, this might offend some people, but this is like, this is how Donald Trump paid no taxes, right? And it's like, oh. we can be mad about it, but it's mm -hmm. completely legal um, as far mm -hmm. as if you have real estate in a depreciation schedule. So that's what I will speak to that is there are ways to buy real estate correctly, which allow you to make your money tax free. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And that definitely gives me some things to uh, really think on and, and learn on as well. Um, so with, with, in regards to real estate, from my understanding, there are additional tax codes that can be added and taken away at, at any given time, depending on what our, uh, administration is under. So 
I agree with you. Definitely real estate can be non-taxable depending on what strategy we use. Um, but when we're looking at say life insurance in general, no matter what happens, even if a policy becomes a modified endowment contract, the death benefit still remains tax free. So there is no um, additional things that the client has to do to ensure that they do not pay tax. They have to pay attention to the code. Like you said, the number is 250,000 today, next year it could be a different number. Um, so those things can change, but I, I want to, I like what you said about the emergency fund saving. Once you get to a certain point, saving no longer matters. I absolutely agree with you. That's going to, that's going to go off a different topic. So I just want to say, I agree with you because of inflation, because of the de devaluation of our dollar, not being tied to anything of actual value. Um, and many other reasons as to why saving is not efficient in today's model. But I, I kind of just want to talk to the people that are making 30 K 40 K 50 K where, where saving does matter. Um, and also there's, I, I still talk to people that are making six figures and up that save their money or they have their money sitting, doing nothing in a certain location until they're ready to deploy that money in some kind of investment. So I want to come back to it. Savings dollars and investing dollars. They're in my opinion, two different things. I know you, you had your uh, view of it when you are making your income from your various streams of income, where do you store your money? So that's going to be one question that I have for you is where do you typically store your money until it's ready to be deployed into some kind of investment? Yeah, good question. So typically when I get money, it goes into a business account, um, a business bank account that's getting you know, whatever, whatever interest rate banks are paying today, it's not much. Almost immediately, um, I, I'm either looking at real estate to buy or stocks to invest in. So I mentioned, for example, I have about 1.3 million sitting in the stock market today. Um, so a lot of my money is in there. A much smaller portion of my money is in a bank um, just because of inflation, the interest rate is trash. Um, of course, it's important to have a certain amount in the bank in case of emergencies, because if you, you know, if you, get sick or, you know, well, something happens and you need quick money. Now it's easy to go to the bank and withdraw it. So that's, that's good. But it's such a small percentage of my portfolio where most of it is in real estate stocks or mutual funds. Um, I have, I mean, I have a million dollars in just one index fund today. Um, it's just, you know, my favorite index fund, I got a million bucks in there and it usually performs at about 10% per year. So yes, I'm not, I'm not parking money in, in banks for the long term. Okay. Good. So at least we agree on, on that topic. Now the question just becomes, where else do we typically um, store our our liquid dollars? Because we've got investment dollars that we don't want to touch because that would interrupt our, our compounding effect and just the investment itself for potential gains. When we're talking about money that we simply position and have it safely stored somewhere, whether that be in a bank, at our home, in our own vault. Um, some cases, some people keep money under their mattress, in their shoebox, whatever that may be. Um, what I like to talk to people about is where are we storing our current monies today? Is it safe? Is it liquid? And what rate of return am I getting on, on those dollars until it's ready to be deployed? So it creates this velocity of money effect. So want to just reiterate some points here that we've gone over so far, which is whole life insurance, not an investment. In my opinion, I, with that knowledge, I don't compare the whole life product or financial product in, in Todd's term to financial products that are considered investments or potentially taxable events. I also separate my understanding of cash flow. Once I've made money, so here are my numbers. I, I make roughly a little over 25K a month and my expenses have gone up to roughly 15,000 a month. So I'm cash flowing 10,000 a month and sometimes higher depending if the number is higher than 25K. So this is super conservative and this is factoring in everything that I have going on personal and business. With this money cash flow, this 10 grand, I then identify a percentage 
that's going to go towards investing and then money that I personally save. So I still save money. I just simply change where I'm saving the money to begin with. So I no longer uh, save money in the banks, right? I, I don't do business in regards. I don't, I don't own in savings account unless I have to buy the, buy the bank. If they require you to have like a, a savings tied to your checking, typically banks do that. So I just want to compare savings vehicles or saving financial products that exist in the marketplace today, where a big portion of American citizens are storing their money. And maybe between myself and Todd can persuade you, convince you, teach you, show you other locations we can position those dollars effectively. So uh, savings, financial products, right? So I'm combining your terminology and my terminology together. So a saving financial product typically are, we got the money market accounts, we've got the savings accounts, and we've got CDs, right? Can you think of anything else um, that you would, that you know of that are liquid? I can pull it out at any given time. Uh, other than these three, these are the only ones I know of so far. Money market accounts are like what one percent, maybe two, and then savings are, you know, zero point one percent, and then CDs are probably also one to two percent earnings. Yeah. So like my my index fund, for example, is completely liquid. I can pull it out with a click of a button, but it's not considered savings because it's you know it's invested in stocks. So um, yeah. it is it is absolutely liquid. But as far as savings accounts, you you covered quite a bit there. Okay. So with that, when I'm talking to my clients, once I've explained to them policy design, also, I also talk about opportunity costs as well. When we're just looking at a place to position our dollars for a period of time that is safe, tax-free and liquid are the three main things that um, a lot of my clients are looking for. And these clients, just so you know, are as low as income of like 30, 40, 50 K a year to about 200, maybe 300 K in revenue per year. And then I am a part of an agency uh, that works with very, very high net worth individuals and your level multi millionaires um, and even like ultra high net worth that are doing 80, 100 million a year that have purchased these products. Um, and there's different iterations in terms of terminology. And I'll just give a few for the audience. We have uh, what's called Boley, bank owned life insurance. Then there's Coley, corporate owned life insurance. And then there's Tolly, trust owned life insurance. And those three, typically, when we start bringing up that terminology, we're dealing with a very, very high net worth individual, family, corporation, typically when we're in the lower six figures, high five figures, low five figure incomes, that terminology isn't expressed. It's usually just cash value life insurance, whole life, index universal life. Um, in some cases, there's something called premium financing. And some people will uh, look at that as well. But I, I don't want to veer off too far from the topic and just kind of stick with the, the main points that we're trying to solve here um looking at the product itself and kind of determining is it possible to improve the product itself the financial product as you stated if i can improve the financial product then it's just a matter of well then i just look at the opportunity cost for it and if i can shorten that time frame then we might have a case here uh, a, a case use where we can get the benefits of both worlds the protection that whole life has the tax free, the liquid, the liquidity, the safe compounding effect, and then the combination of the real estate, the stocks, index funds, mutual funds, small business, etc. So if we're just looking at savings financial products, we understand these rates are very undesirable, which is why we're living in a time now where between yourself, Todd, myself and many other financial people, that think differently from a Dave Ramsey are saying, hey, you need to get your money out of these locations because it ain't doing nothing for you. Because inflation is what? 6.8%. In reality, it's probably 10 or higher. 
So if you literally kept your money in the bank, kept saving, because this is what a lot of us are taught to save our money for multiple years upon end, you would have less purchasing power when you actually go to use those dollars. You can agree with that, right, Todd? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's like, this is why you, myself, and us are like, hey, you need to invest your money. You need to increase your income, acquire cash flowing assets that produce income. And then the third component, which I think we might, uh, where we where we go off, is to wrap the asset. How do you wrap an asset in, in your opinion uh for i'll just give you mine the way i wrap my assets is through whole life insurance and i guess in your case it's going to be term but i guess that's only for a, a temporary period of time and then at, at some point uh i'm, I'm sure you're going to reach a new probably a new problem uh in their in the world of estate planning and trust and wills and things like that so for the time being as a young person we're both young you're 29 i'm 25 if i can improve the financial product being whole life to reduce the opportunity cost dramatically and then increase the production, the performance of the dividends, then I might be in a, in a safer, a more ideal location. So coming back to how insurance agents are paid, I said, you know, give an example, if an insurance agent had 100% commissional uh, payout off the premiums, look how much money it's paid right up front that is literally where your money went right into the agent's pocket and you have barely anything to show for in cash value so in order to design the policy to be a little more effective way more effective for the client aka you myself the insurance agent has to be willing to reduce his commission commissionable payout dramatically I'm talking dramatically to give you an example. Here is a real life, uh, whole life insurance product that's I personally own, and I am paying in a total of 70,000 a year in principal dollars. And then I have $7,000 that goes to the premium. So 10% of my 70 went to cost of insurance, right? And mm -hmm. literally being the, the whole life component. Right. So the insurance agent with this company, Guardian, I believe their commission will pay out uh, is, a, is a max of, uh, I, I want to say, 60 percent, probably higher. So seven thousand dollars times 60 percent, that's four thousand two hundred. If they were to design the policy like this agent did for you, where say it was like a 50 50 split. 35,000 times 60%, his commission is 21,000. And if he went with a smaller life insurance company, like maybe like a Penn Mutual or a Mutual of Omaha or one of these other mutual dividend paying whole life insurance companies that are smaller, the commission will payouts are a lot higher with smaller life insurance companies. And typically smaller life insurance companies don't provide as much of a dividend performance. Their performance, their actual dividend performance, the internal rate of returns are not as favorable when you work with say like a mass mutual, Northwestern, New York life, or like a guardian, their performance tend to be much higher. They're much stronger financial performance, things like that. We, I don't want to get into too much into the weeds of that because that can uh, vary in opinion from agent to agent. But what I'm doing right now is probably pissing off a lot of agents because the viewer is going to be like, holy crap, is that how much money they're able to make? And the answer is yes. And in fact, more if they are the actual broker, they can make way more because of volume and then the higher contracts that get paid out. So an agent has to be willing to take a humongous haircut to design a policy that's more favorable for guys like Todd that strictly love to invest and create cash flow, right? So with that being said, this 70 grand, only 7,000 went to my cost, opportunity costs. Then there's a portion of this 63,000, which purchases term life because we understand and you agree term life is super cheap in the beginning and can become very expensive once it expires. And the idea is that your term life, by the time it expires, you would have created enough assets cash flowing where you, where you, you know, you wouldn't need that. Right? 
So that's typically mm -hmm. how it's how it's taught. So what I did with my insurance policy, I took the best of term life and whole life, combined it together in this PUA paid up additions where it has a blended term writer to it only for a period of time, roughly say about seven years, right? If that uh, might go longer, but just about seven years that term writer will be on. And I've got at the age of 23, I've got a $4 million death benefit and my starting cash value day one uh, was roughly about 60,000 and some change, probably like 60,300 or 60,500 day one. And the other thing that in this type of design, typically the first one to three years um, with a lot of insurance policies, you can't even borrow from it in the first year it has to be, it's called the vested period. Right? I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that. There's like a vested mm -hmm. period. The, the policy has to cook, has to grow, whatever. Well, with other insurance companies and policy design, I can have access to borrow upwards close to about 90% of the cash value within 10 business days, typically. So within 10 business days, I'm able to borrow up to roughly about 90% of the cash value. There's still a problem here right? Even if you did all of this, right? Even if you designed it perfectly, you're still running a negative, right? Probably 15% to roughly 20% negative in the first year. The benefit is instead of waiting 13 to 15 years on this end for the policy just to break even in terms of principal dollars going in, with this type of design, we're able to break even typically within the first four to seven years right? So I pay in 70 grand, 70 grand for about four years by the fourth, fifth, and depending on age and health, it could be as long as six or seven. But in my case, because I'm young, super healthy, uh, my policy would break even probably like year five, probably sooner than that. Um, and depending on the performance, the dividends, the payouts of the company could be a little sooner. But even with that, you still have that problem of running a negative for the first few years, your internal rate of return uh, for the life of the policy is probably going to float anywhere between three and 4%. And that's still nothing uh, in comparison to your real estate example that you gave and stocks, right? So it's still like, this is where I agree with you. Investing dollars over here is still way more efficient than having just a whole life and not doing that. Because how can you if you know, when, when we're dealing with, you know, people's actual income numbers. So in, in my mm -hmm. case, in my case, because I'm a high income earner and my definition of how I separate savings dollars and investing dollars, this 70,000 bucks right here is literally money that I save per year. It comes from out of my savings bucket that was sitting here in these terrible accounts and I'm moving it into this location, whole life. And then because of the liquidity feature, the safety feature, the tax-free feature, and also understanding that the I can't lose money once the money's in there, it's gonna grow nothing. It's, not, it's gonna go nowhere but up forever and ever for as long as I live. I then borrow and I do exactly what you're doing at, at the moment. You're doing real estate and stocks at the moment. I'm personally invested in uh, stocks, I do crypto, I do index funds, but a lot of my money goes right back into my business as a content creator, as a financial consultant, as a lead generation guy, affiliate marketing, network marketing. I actually feed the money back into my business, which solves for the borrowing uh, to offset the interest cost of borrowing because i said over here usually the loan rates are between five and six percent this video mm -hmm. this video won't get posted till about 2022 so in 2022 the rates are actually going to go lower they might be like four percent um with with the new uh insurance policies that get written in 2022 the loan rates actually dropping as well as the guarantees of whole life are dropping so I just wanted to kind of put that out there in case someone's like, wait a minute, my loan rate is much lower than that. Well, that's just because, you know, in 2022, the, the loan rates dropped. Um, so any questions, thoughts so far? I know I just dumped a lot, 
Um, well, that was great information, and you're incredibly thorough. And and frankly, you're a really good presenter. So props to you on all this. Um, quick question. Mm -hmm. So the seventy thousand dollars that you pay every year. Can you tell me how many years are you going to be paying that seventy thousand, or is yeah. it going to be at some point like, oh, after ten years it's paid up, or how how is that calculated? Right, right. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen uh, so you can see uh, how my policy actually looks. Can you see cool. all the corners? Like you can see it fully. Um, on the left margin, I see numbers three, four, five, six, seven. Oh, there we go. Okay, yes, That's boom, perfect. All right, yes. So this particular life insurance policy is only designed to be funded for about seven years. So okay. full principal amount of money would be 490K going into it um, for the first seven years. And I have the option to go longer if I want to. So I can, I can mm -hmm. continue to add in money as little as 7,000 or as high as maybe 28,000, 21,000, only for a period of time. Um, the idea is that this policy becomes a reduced paid up at the beginning of year eight. And from then on, that cash flow is going to continue to grow. But what, what also is very interesting that most insurance policies are not designed to do is the death benefit will also increase along with the cash. Flow. So it won't catch up to 4 million. In fact, it'll surpass 4 million in death benefits. So. As I get older and older, if I do nothing but just paying 490K with my savings dollars, money that I really wasn't uh, positioning or deploying for an investment because I already have money being invested, and this is just savings dollars, what ends up happening is in my later, say I die at 95 years old, mm -hmm. death benefit could be potentially uh, upwards of $6.5 million. And so like the way I look at that is like, hmm, I only put in... 490 in principle, and I could treat this like a home equity line of credit or personal line of credit or business line of credit. And I could take from the cash values uh, year over year and use that to do exactly what Todd does. Or I can, I can hire a Todd or work with a Todd, invest with a Todd, learn what he does uh, with my, again, my savings dollars. And then the cash flows that would come from it could either pay back the loans in the policy itself, restoring it back to zero um, or or not, right? There's, there's that flexibility there. W what's super interesting is regardless of how much money I borrow, whatever, if I died at, like say, die at 95 and I had a million dollars out in loans, or say I had $2 million out in loans, the insurance company is just gonna minus 2 million from 6.5 and then boom, the, the net get, gets paid out to the air where in my case I'm I'm you know I'm gonna have a a trust a, a multitude of trusts and family office and all that to take care of the estate taxes upon death and and that is a much higher level conversation for the for, high, for the higher net worth people um, but for everyday Americans that uh, say don't um, I, I, I hate to say it um, but it kind of sucks when I'm working with clients uh, especially s some, I'm sure you've dealt with this, call it lack of knowledge, right? Or mm -hmm. ignorance, just not wanting to do the things that you do because of fear, doubt. Oh, you know, I could lose the investment. I could lose the house or whatever that may be. When I show them the whole life, it's almost like a little step that they can say, all right, it has a guarantee, it has insurance, and it's tax-free, it's gonna compound, it's gonna grow, it's gonna save money. Maybe that's like the, the bridge or the gap to get them to talk to you uh, and be open to having that investing conversation. And now they have a tool that allows them to solve for both security and then investments that are considered high risk, um, but can produce high returns, right? So I hope I answered your question earlier uh, mm -hmm. about the uh, the funding amount. So seven years, mm -hmm. that's how it's designed. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else that came to mind? Um, could you go back to how much money is your death benefit if you die at age 65? Could you show that again? I think it was like a little over 4 million, but I don't remember. And you're 25 right now, right? 20, uh, yeah, currently 25. Got it when I was 23. So let me go back to show. Got it. 
offering. So, so 65, it's like, yeah, 4.2 million. Is that right? 4.2. So kind of right back where it originally started at 4 million. Right. And the reason for the reason for that is the term rider that I have. If you if you see a, a face amount of one year term in the very first year, or well, I'm sorry, this is actually the third year um, because I'm in my third policy year at the moment. This is an actual in force illustration of my current policy. So for my third year, I'm purchasing about one point eight million or so of term for that one year. And it's going to gradually continuously drop because my principal dollars, the 70K, is owning more of this 4 million. I'm renting the 4 million, like a big portion of that is term, so I'm renting it. But as the years progress, as the dividends get paid out to me, as my cash value, which is paid up additions, which simply this column right here, the cash value of all additions, I, I own um, an additional 193,000 for a total of 1.3 million. So now I own that portion, 1.8, I don't own, but I'm renting. And you can see how that number goes down as this number goes up. And so what mm -hmm. ends up happening is once I drop the term, notice how the death benefit drops because I'm no longer paying for that term, no need to, right? It actually reduces my cost and it actually improves the dividend payouts a little bit better. I'm no longer allocating, uh, well, in this case, there's no money, no longer going into the policy. Um, so what's left, roughly 515K, that's really just gonna gonna grow. And then as you see at mm -hmm. the end of that year, goes to about 544 and you know keeps going along the way. And then at 65, come back, we're at 4.283. Um, again, not an investment, but just a, an area that I can position money for a period of time. Got it. Any okay. Questions? So on the 65 year old part, I think you were getting ready to get into something along that. Yeah. So, um, and I'll share my screen with you in a sec here. Um, but so this is where, um, this is where probably you and I disagree. And again, we can disagree and still be friends. <laughs> I think you're a great guy and you're providing a lot of value to your audience. So all of that is noted. Um, when I have money, I actually do not separate it into, okay, this is savings. This is investing. Um, I have my small emergency fund that I need if something happens, but then every dollar that I have is an investment and, and it could be a good investment or it could be a bad investment. So like, um, for example, I just took my whole family to Hawaii. I took my mom, my sister, my wife, um, my sister's family, like all that stuff. Right. So that, that is money that I'm parting with. Um, and that's how I look at things. I, I don't look at it like, Oh, this is, this is for saving and this is for investing and this is for leisure. I say, here's my pool of money and here's what I'm parting with. So when I, go, sorry, go ahead. Were you going to say something? No, no, you're good. Oh, okay. So when I talk about how I don't believe whole life for me particularly is a good financial product is because I look at, well, what else could I use that money for? So um, I'll share my screen real quick. Um, Let's see if I can do window. Mm -hmm. I'll give you access. Um, okay. Okay. Here's the one. Okay. Share. Let me know if you see what I see. I'll go back to this yep. thing. Okay. So after the couple of years of funding your, your policy up front, you said you put in 496,000. Is that right? Uh, 490K principal. Yep. 490,000 um, is the principal. Okay. Did I do that right? Um, yep. Yes. Um, a, a, a annual addition, you're not going to put anything else in because it's funded. Awesome. Yeah. So um, we're, we're assuming we're in year eight. Got it. Okay. So, um, got it. So then we're, what we're going to do is, um, if you just let this ride for, cause you're 25 now, right? Yeah. Okay. You're 25. We're going to say a 10% annual return just cause that's what the S and P 500 has averaged since inception. By the time you're 25 or sorry, by the time you're 65, if you take that same principle of 490,000, you put it in the S&P 500, you don't contribute anything else, you let it ride at the interest rate that is done historically since inception, by the time you reach the normal retirement age, you'll have over $22 million in that account when you're 65, and you don't have to die to get it. And I understand people are going to say, oh, well, what if stocks go up? What if stocks go down? It's not a guarantee. You're right. It's an investment. It's not a guarantee. But what it is, is it's historical averages. Um, and if I just Google, like, I'll just try to Google here. What, what does the S&P 
P500 at its inception. Let's see. It says around 10% since inception in like, you know, the twenties or whatever. So of course, historical returns are no predictor of, you know, future re returns. And I, I understand that. But when I look at that and I say, man, I can make, I, I can invest this and grow it to $22 million instead of having, you know, 4 million bucks when I die. Um, plus two, by the way, um, I don't know where you have your um, stocks, but mine are all with Vanguard. And as I mentioned, I have a seven figure stock portfolio in Vanguard. I can take margin loans from Vanguard at 2%. I know you mentioned five to 6% from the insurance policy and, and those numbers will go down in 22, as you mentioned before. But I mean, at, at 2%, I can borrow anything that I want at 2% and then go invest this again, or, you know, put it into real estate or whatever. So it's not, and I think this might be where we fundamentally are different is like, I'm not saying, oh, well, this 490,000, it would be in a bank account earning zero. So it's better to have it in a whole life insurance policy. In my mind, this 490,000, it's just like, how can I deploy that the best way that I can? And for me, the answer is stocks, real estate, or my business. It's, it certainly wouldn't be a, a whole life policy. It just, it just wouldn't be, in my opinion. I'll stop sharing my screen so we can come back to whatever you have to present. Perfect. This is really good stuff, by the way. Uh, this this really helps me have um, better conversations with uh, prospects, existing clients that are contemplating their fundamentals of finance. And now I'm starting to really understand how we differ. So it's not that you don't like whole life or think it's a bad product like you've been saying multiple times you're simply fundamentally you don't save period right whatever you do have is emergency it's liquid it's there like a god forbid type of a, of a thing but you're fundamentally putting a lot of your money your time money talent treasure into investments that you know like real estate and stocks and things like that and that's why you do so well and then you're looking at the overall projection oh, this thing's gonna grow to, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 million dollars and, and upwards of, you know, we're talking a lot of money without a doubt. How do you deal with the estate planning portion of things? Like, are you gonna get to that age, say 65 um, or 55 when your term expires? What, what assets wrap the assets that's building that all that wealth that you're creating like in in your mind because the way i look at just to build wealth is to increase my income first purchase or acquire cash flowing assets that produce cash flow and then wrap the assets to to protect it and to me that's any type of insurance cyber security insurance identity insurance legal protection insurance lawyers doctors cpas and then whole life so when you get to that age 65 when i have 20 plus million just in stocks alone. What do I do then? Like, what is the strategy after 65? Once you've accumulated so much, amassed so much wealth, how, how do I get out of taxes, the tax man, Uncle Sam, and then estate taxes when I die, when they take roughly 40%, if not higher? How do we deal with that? Well, it, it depends on a few things. It depends on how much money you have. Um, you can put your money in trust. I mean, that's what I have. I married a CPA. I didn't marry her because she's a CPA, <laughs> but my wife is an accountant and she does all of our estate planning. You can give right now, um, it's a, and you might know this better than I do, but let's say you're married, right? Hmm. Spouse number one can give, I think, is it 11 million, uh, like 11.2 million tax free to their um, kids. And then the spouse number two can do the same. So it's like 25 million you can give tax free um, over anything above that. Or I'm sorry, over a period of time. Or is that like, no, so like, so like, let's say, let's say me, me and my wife, when we go to die or right, whatever, let's, let's say that, let's say we both die when we're 80. Okay. And let's say that we have 25 million bucks. Um, I believe, and I could be wrong. We can look this up. We can fact check it. Yeah. I believe that you're allowed to give um, 11 million or so tax free to your um, your heirs. Basically, they can inherit that without paying any taxes. 11 Through the million trust. Per spouse. Through the um, trust. That's just well, not even necessarily a trust. That's just like as far as like your inheritance goes. Mm. The first 11 million, I believe, per spouse is tax free, and then anything above that, there's that the Republicans call it the death tax. 
um, Democrats call it the estate tax. Um, but yeah, so you can have your money in trust um, as we do. Again, I have a term life insurance policy. I have other insurance policies too, but they're, you know, they're not whole life. They're like term, like I, you know, I have an insurance policy for my wife's wedding ring and stuff like that. So I'm not, I'm not anti-insurance. Again, I'm an insurance agent. Yeah. I'm just saying what I do is I, I try to look at everything holistically and I say, well, where can I put my money? So it's going to grow the best. And then let's say I amass 20 million, like for example, and this may be me, this may be, I may be weird or whatever, but let's go back to the number when we're 65, you have 4.2 million versus 22 million. Okay. You can leave that $4.2 million to your family tax free. Let's just say for sake of argument, I'm completely wrong about the, the death tax and that all of that 22 million will be taxed at 40%. Well, if I'm wrong, then I at least get to leave my kids $10 million right? Or, or, or $12 million because mm -hmm. so much was gone to taxes as opposed to the 4 million from the life insurance policy. But, um, maybe you can fact check me on this. Um, I, I believe that, and it, I, I believe that, that each spouse can leave $11 million to their kids. Maybe that's total, but, um, you feel free to, to, to look that up and see if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, for the audience listening, um, if there's, cause I know I have viewers that are CPAs that also sell life insurance that are in your world, real estate investors, definitely drop some comments, some articles mm -hmm. or some, you know, somewhere in the U S code, the tax code that can, you know, help us, uh, make sure we're saying the right stuff. Um, but that's interesting. I like that. And I, again, I would, I would agree on that point. If my fundamental of finance was, I don't save. Uh, whatsoever. And I just, I, de I continue to deploy and deploy and deploy uh, money into these investments and things like that. So I guess the, the most ethical thing as a financial coach, financial consultant and content creator, when I'm talking to my audience, when I'm actually on a paid consultation, I actually have a client with me. If they're like you, a Todd, they're like, Hey, my personality or my financial profile, because I know there's different financial profiles. You've got people who are misers. You've got people who are, you know, uh, gamblers. There's people who are high risk, high reward. And then there's like turtles, people that, you know, only go into safe tier one, you know, type assets. So I guess when I'm talking to people, because this really helps me a lot where I'm dealing with people. If I'm dealing with, say, a version of you, Todd, that you're like, dude, saving stupid, inflation's at all times high. We're in hyperinflation. Uh, you're not earning. You're not earning anything in these. In these, whether it's the savings, financial products, the the whole life, um, regardless of the tax-free component and the compounding effect, your opportunity cost is insane to to even catch up with what I'm doing in real estate and stocks. Then the proper thing for me to do would be to say, okay, you need to talk to like a Todd. You need to talk to like a Robert Kiyosaki, even a Grant Cardone um, type of person that is going to really align with you on that on that frequency, because you can sleep at night knowing that you don't need to have a uh, hundred thousand in your savings account. Like I literally have clients there. They have 50, 100, 150,000, 200,000 in savings accounts in in a CD, in a money market account. I'm like. Oh my God, they don't just, they don't realize that they just lost 40% of their purchasing power in the last 12 months. They don't realize that. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. such a hard conversation for me to tell them that. And then to say, you need to invest and you need to do this and you get your money out there and get it rolling, rocking and rolling. And they're like, no, my wife said we need to have this. And now I'm like, okay, happy yeah. wife, happy life. Got it. Totally get it. <laughs> but if I'm dealing with someone like yourself, that's willing to take those measures, then I'm going to say, um, before you look at this whole life, infinite banking thing, um, I want you to take a look at Todd's channel and kind of see what he's doing and see where his, uh, fundamentals are in regards to compound interest and growth in, in investments and things like that before you allocate it. Was that like a safe, you know, kind of uh, ethical way to yeah. approach this? Cause man, do I deal with all kinds of people? I'm dealing with heavy faith people in different right. religions. I'm dealing with atheists, non-believers, and then people in between. So I'm always trying to, yeah, navigate, I think, you know, 
the the whole point is that personal finance there is no one size fits all right um and i'm certainly not anti-savings i do have a nest egg like of course you have to have something for emergencies right but i especially that i'm young i'm a little bit older than you but i'm i'm like this is the time to take risk and you know i the, the gotcha. stuff that i'm doing right now it wouldn't be the same advice I give to an 80 year old. <laughs> I'm not going to tell an 80 year old to go leverage and buy an apartment building, right? I'll probably tell them to be a lot more conservative. Um, but I, I will tell you, I will tell you this. Um, and if this tells you anything, that's fine. Um, I was so blessed to be able to become a multimillionaire in my twenties. And a, and a part of the reason why I did that is because, you know, um, instead of which, which looked like a really good plan that you have, but instead of putting 70,000 per year, you know, for a couple of years into a whole life plan, I took that 70,000 per year and I was leveraging real estate and I was buying stocks. Th I mean, this year from my real estate business, I'll make around $2 million, um, in, in income. Right. Um, and then I'm going to take that and invest in other things too. But, um, it's like the down payment to my third house was $65,000. And I was able to buy, you know, a six hundred and thirty thousand dollar house. By the way, that property is a uh, eight bedrooms and four bathrooms that I rent out by the bedroom, and it produces four grand a month in cash flow, right? My, I think the down payment to my fifth house was around seventy thousand. Um, huh. And same thing because what I, my strategy is usually I wait until I can buy another primary residence so I can get like ten percent down. I move into that house, I buy it, rent it out, and, and move on. So. Um, my strategy has been incredibly aggressive um, for growth. And it seems that um, perhaps our upbringings made us different this way because um, we had similar upbringings, but your thing was about safety. I want safety and security, and I really want to have that protection. Mine was, I want to make millions and millions of dollars. Mm. And obviously I have measures in, in place to protect the wealth that I've built. Um, but and, and that's why I have this like, I don't think of it as like one bucket for savings, one bucket for this, one bucket for that. I like, here's all my money. What's the best thing that I can do with this money at the time? And as you grow and as you age, that answer might change. Um, we have a baby on the way, right? That's awesome. At, at some point, we're, we're going to be putting money away for college and, you know, all these other things. Sorry, I hit my microphone. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? It, it changes as you grow and there's no one size fits all. So I'm not anti insurance i'm not anti whole insurance right um i'm not anti any of that i'm saying for me personally and for other folks that i know whose goal was to basically become multi-millionaires young it it wasn't going to make it happen is that fair like it i i probably wouldn't be a multi-millionaire today if instead of buying real estate and stocks i was instead buying life insurance products and who knows maybe i would be but i i don't think i would have the net worth or income that i have today if my strategy had been different yeah, and I think I am you um, contemplating, right? Because you you got four years on me and I've started on my personal financial journey at the age of like 18, 19, jumping in and out of multi-level marketing companies, network marketing companies, direct sales. And then after two and a half years working in food and beverage, finally, you know, said, you know, personal finance is where I want to dwell. And the way I've been making my money for the first two years of starting my YouTube channel was doing consultations, helping people pretty much get out of debt or pay off any bad consumer debts until we're left with like the mortgage and maybe student loans where the rates are tremendously low. And then I'll try to shift the conversation. Like how do we turn that liability, that house into an asset that can produce cash flow? Um, versus just taking the next seven years to wipe out that mortgage, which we can do that. Cause I, you know, again, constantly dealing with people with double my age where they're like, Denzel, I don't care what Todd says. I can make 20 million, 40, 60, 80 million, multi-millionaire. Dude, I just want a paid off house. I want to live happy with my wife. I want to make sure my kids have security. They don't have to worry about uh, the cost to bury me. I want to make sure I'm completely debt free and I'm cash flow positive. And that could mean making a hundred grand a year. Um, and so it's so hard to have that conversation with, with kind of getting them to think bigger. Like why not a million? Why not 10 million? Like why does a number limit your ability and your potential to be great? You know, there's only gonna be one of you on planet earth that will ever exist. 
There's never been a copy of you. There never will be. You're so unique out of the seven plus billion people on planet Earth. Why would you waste that opportunity, right? So I, I totally hear you with that. And I guess we, we've got these, these uh, similar upbringings, but like different trauma almost. And it's kind of like how we conduct ourselves in the world of finance. And then we project that to other people that may be resonated, which is why, again, I got to say thank you so much for coming on here, saying yes, and giving your perspectives because you're going to be able to talk to some of my clients that are, I mean, they're gun ho. They're like, dude, we shoot from the hip. We don't even aim. We just, because I know if I can get to 50 million, I've just solved 95% of my problems versus a big group of my clientele are like, just want to get out of debt. I want to have a nice, pretty credit score. I want to have my nice emergency fund and my savings account and my whole life to protect me in case of death. And I want to be able to borrow from my policy to make safe investments in the marketplace and maybe buy a business or something like that, do a co-venture or partnership to that degree. Uh, and then if I end up with a couple of millions of dollars at age 65, and in my case, just looking at the whole life policy, not factoring in what did I do with the 490 grand? And that was going to be the second component that I was going to dive into was to talk on the 490,000 that goes in, how much of that gets borrowed out? And then what does that produce in rates of returns? And then does that um, start to narrow the gap of that $22 million number by age 65? I believe I figured it out in multiple different ways and I wanted to get your, your feedback on that. So what I like to do is kind of dive into that right now. So we've got the $22 million number that if I just took 490 grand, let it grow at 10% according to the S and P rate of return, uh, and just, you know, let it grow all the way to age 65. I'll have 22 million roughly even factoring in crashes, you know, whatever it is, taxes and, you know, mm -hmm internal rate of return versus average, not getting into all that. Let's just say it got to 22 million. Now with um, this policy, I, at the moment, I've got uh, 79,000 in loans and I've got 201,000 in total cash value. So 201 minus 79, that's how much liquid available cash value I can borrow from to, to use to my advantage. Um, so what I wanna share with you is just looking at the principal dollars that go into the policy that 490k uh, by age 65 uh, will be roughly 4.2 in death benefit and then let me just look at the cash value real quick the cash value says it'll be around 2.2 in cash value at age 65. now what i do what i do personally of the principal dollars that'll grow um, from year to year as the money is growing, I borrow 66% of the available cash value, and then I'm gonna put it to work and deploy it into your world of investing, right? Um, real estate is the only location that I have not penetrated just yet. Um, what I've been doing is actually getting involved in businesses that have to do with real estate. So for example, I partnered with a guy that's a, a general contractor. So as a content creator and a lead generation guy, I bring him business in real estate and then I get a, a referral commission just for that. So kind of in real estate, but not like actually owning the property, collecting rents and doing things like that. But I will, I will get there. So Let's just take the 490,000 times it by 66%. That's $323,400. This money over the next seven years gets deployed into a multitude of different investments that I have studied for myself, learned, um, and got really educated and comfortable deploying my money there. So that is definitely stocks. So I have a brokerage account. So we'll just, you know, brokerage account and let's, let's put 10% on it. Um, like if I just bought the S and P, like in my case, I'm buying dividend paying stocks. I'm buying index funds, low cost, zero cost index funds that will, you know, do well, uh, that I believe will do well because of their performance, their historical performance. 
So let's just say 10%. I have money that goes into crypto. So I'm buying the top cryptocurrencies and then a big portion of my money that goes into crypto uh, by stable coins, uh, USDC specifically, and I'm earning a 12% uh, rate of return on that. Unless something changes, I'm, I'm locked in at the 12%. Um, in addition, I do a strategy on uh, recapturing expenses. So not real estate, but I'll just, you know, abbreviate it. Recapturing expenses. So money that I spend already in my personal economy and my business economy actually will sit in the policy. And this is money that I'm going to spend. So this 490,000, not all of it comes from the discretionary income. Actually, a good portion of it comes from expenses. And that number from my notes is roughly 26,000 a year. So times that by seven, it's $182,000 of bills and expenses. Money that's leaving my economy to pay for my personal life. But majority of it is business expenses that actually, you know, by investing, by reinvesting in myself, which is my business, produces more profit. So I'm able to get a higher rate of return. Uh, and so what ends up happening is when I borrow from the policy uh, and I have that cash value loan, uh, that money goes back into my business account or my personal. And I'll use a credit card where I'm getting three to 5% in cash back rewards in addition to statement credits. So that's a couple of hundred and in reality, it's roughly three to 5K a year in cash back rewards that I get and then a mixture of points. In addition, the bills, this 182,000, the bills are changed from monthly to annual. So I save money by converting the bill. Instead of paying it on a monthly basis, I pay it on an annual and my average savings is roughly 12%, right? Just by doing that. And some bills are like a 20% savings or you save an entire month or two months, whatever it may be. So that's subscriptions. That's Is that because they give you a discount if you pay it all up front or something like that? Correct. Kind of like car insurance, right. right? Any type of bill, any type of bill that I can switch from monthly to annual and run it through a credit card, I'll get the 12% on the bill itself savings. So, so I'm no longer actually coming out of pocket a total of 182. Um, and then the three to 5% in the cash back rewards itself, right? So this is money that I'm going to spend no matter what. Uh, and then, so we got the stocks, the crypto recapturing of expenses. And then I also do a little bit of lending. I also have an HSA account. So with my lending, I'm getting a 10% rate of return. I, I lend, I, I lent money to a, a black owned business and um, the, the initial agreement was I was going to get a percentage of the, uh, the products that they sold, uh, but they've been going through some tough financial situations. So we actually just renegotiated the agreement to just a flat 10% payback. And I, you know, so I gave them 10 grand, I'm gonna get a thousand bucks back 10%, nothing crazy. Um, and that, you know, helps them grow and totally flexible with how they pay me back. I, you know, they could take as, as, as long as they want uh, to pay me back, but the, the interest is flat. So it's not compounding year to year. It's just flat payback a thousand, 10% of 10 K. So I did it like that just to, you know, help them out. And then I'm able to get a, a return that offsets my borrowing costs, which my borrowing cost is a 5.66% loan. In the insurance policy itself, my crediting rate is a little bit above, it's actually 6%, is what I'm getting credited on whatever money I borrow from the policy itself. So it creates this wash effect where in reality, maybe my cost is like one or 2% in the beginning years. And then once the policy produces a positive IRR, which will happen in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh year, then I no longer have cost of borrowing, which can get really interesting. And then finally my HSA, uh, which in there I went low did 6%, but I know I, I know I've been doing better in the account. Um, and this 
account, specifically in the beginning, is purchasing silver and gold. And once it gets to a certain point, uh, then I'll most likely, with the person that I'm learning from that I that's working with me, convert that uh, and buy real estate, like what you do, but within the HSA. Uh, and that'll be like my medical retirement plan when I get old and you know my back blows out and you gotta do all these other stuff. <laughs> from standing doing YouTube for 45 years, because that's how I do my content, always standing up and kind of integrating. But God forbid anything happens to me, uh, that HSA is also tax-free use in regards to medical. So I'm pretty sure you're aware, with that, aware of that uh, unique tool. So all these different things are yielding these, I would say very competitive, uh, attractive rates of returns. And when I was running the numbers for myself, uh, on a lot of like specifically like just the crypto with the stable coins roughly 15 grand a year I buy USDC so I've been doing that for 2020 and 2021 so only two years so far and if I do that for about seven uh, no I'm sorry if I do it for about I think 20 years 20 25 years I think that alone would have created about like 2 million plus um, and then of which I could you know sell it uh, for cash flow or convert it, buy other cryptos, have the, you know, rates go tremendously higher in that case. So when we start factoring in the second component of the policy, I think there can be some uh, uh, additional benefits here where if I can reduce my opportunity costs as low as the insurance company will allow. So just so you know, the, the lowest that you can go is literally 10% of whatever you're putting in principal dollars. Some insurance companies will let you go as high as 95% to 5% in premium, some insurance companies, um, but that's typically the smaller ones. So I tend to stay with the bigger mutual dividend paying life insurance companies because they have typically better returns. Um, and then policy design, where we're designing it for minimum commission, maximum cash value upfront in the beginning years, so then I can borrow from the policy and deploy it into things that I know or are very educated in that will that will do well. Uh, and the last the last component of all of this is this word right here, a co-vestment. So this has to do with uh, me being involved with uh, an FBO, a faith based organization. So this is part of my faith in, in kingdom living, uh, being a part of an organization, like an association, aka a church, where I put my dollars into a church format. And then the church, through their tax accepted status, they're able to acquire the things that you and I acquire as individuals or as corporations. They acquire it as an association, an, un an unincorporated corporation or unincorporated association tax accepted they don't have to pay tax and they go and syndicate wealth same way we do it but without any of the taxes involved and they have more flexibility uh, and then that money comes back in the form of cash flow to the members the participating the bona fide participating members of that co-vestment right so that's like the last thing that i do and and that right there is like my it's going to be my bread and butter as I get old and older because of the uh, the exceptions, the accepted status that th this particular faith-based organization has. So with that being said, I know I just went uh, real deep in the meat and potatoes again, um, but now that you get to see the full picture of what I'm doing, any questions, any thoughts uh, in terms of bridging that $22 million gap, can you potentially see how I can start getting close to you? I'm not saying I'll beat you, without a doubt, because I still had the cost here for the first four to seven years. I'm not saying I'll beat you, but I am saying I think I can not not be so far off from you. And then the, also the, the tax-free component here of what I'm uh, dealing with, which I'm sure you're also getting as well because you've got the, the right access to the, the, the tools necessary to leverage the tax code to your, to your advantage. So I guess... Um... First of all, yeah, thank you for being so thorough. Um, it's really awesome. Um, and you're very detailed. My pushback would be everything you mentioned, stocks, recapture expenses, crypto, peer-to-peer -peer lending, HSA, 
you can do all of that without first getting a whole life policy. So what I mean by that is you pay 490,000 into a whole life policy, you borrow 323,400 out of it at 5.6%, and then you go do all these things. I'm doing exactly what you're doing. I'm just skipping buying the whole life policy first. And because I'm skipping that portion, I don't have that big upfront cost. And instead of having to borrow, you know, 323,000 at 5.6%, I get to use the full 490K and not pay points on it and just go invest it in, in stuff that I would do. So that would be, and it's, I, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. Yeah. I think my strategy is like, okay, well, how do I make the most money? And for me, buying a whole life policy isn't a part of that strategy. Like if the strategy is make the most money possible, a whole life policy isn't what I'm going to be doing. I am I mean, I do, you know, I do the same thing. I put all of my bills on auto pay with my credit card and I have a cashback credit card that does that. I run everything through my business. So I take the deduction. I also, I mean, you can certainly run it through a charity or a church. There's something called a charity remainder trust. You can do all of that stuff without the whole life policy component. And I would probably guess that, and I'll put it this way. Um, if I'm a whole life insurance company, right? Let's just say I'm a whole life insurance company, not an agent, not a broker, but I'm actually the company. Uh, I'm not the guy getting the commissions. I'm the guy that's actually the, the company, right? Mm -hmm. If someone like you front loads and pays $70,000 per year, for you know the, the time to get to the 490k in order to get the four million dollar death benefit i'm going to take that seventy thousand dollars per year as the insurance company and i'm going to invest it into the s p just like i would have had i not bought the policy so so in other words i'm happy to offer you denzel a death benefit of 4.2 million if your premium allows me to go make 22 million. If you paying me that 70K per year for the first couple of years allows me to invest and go make 22 million, of course I'm happy to give you 4.2 million or 6 million or whatever it is when you, I think when you were 95, it was like, um, what was it? Can you go back to that actually? When you were 95, like, sure. was it 7 million when you were 95? It was, it was like 6.5. Um, okay. And this is in the event I do nothing. Yeah, so 6.5. This is in the event I do Got not it. But just pay in 490 K and obviously, of course. Yeah, no, that's, that's noted for sure. It doesn't, it doesn't take into effect your, 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 um, strategy. But if I just go back here, um, let me just, cause this is, this is going to be funny to, to show. Um, I'll share my screen again. Um, let me know when you can see it. I'm okay. going to refresh this. Okay. So I'm the insurance company. Denzel has paid me 490,000. Okay. This does not put into any effect if you you know what you go do in your other businesses you donate to church you you buy stuff on your own time it doesn't uh, do anything to that but you're not going to put any more in because you've already front loaded it let's say denzel you live a nice long happy life to age 95 or 25 today so boom that's 70 years okay you've paid me this i'm going to invest it at 10 percent. that's 386 million dollars that's almost half a billion dollars 386 million dollars that my life insurance company has been able to grow from your premium and so of course i'm happy to give you six and a half or seven million because from the seventy thousand that i've gotten from you over the years to equate to four hundred ninety thousand, i just invest that i make myself 386 million I'm $380 million ahead after I paid you your death benefit at 95. So that's what I look at. It, it's, it has less to do with your actions outside of the policy. And it has more to do with, well, what, what else could I be doing with this 490,000? Like, right? Like, like whether I'm the life insurance company or I'm the consumer or whatever, what can I be doing with this money that is different? And so that's why I look at it. And that's why I say I'm, whole life insurance isn't a scam. It's, it's not right. a, um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not a rip off. It's not, it's, it's just like, I can, I can go do something that will produce better for me than what the policy will pay out. In my opinion, a, as a young man who has time to take advantage of compound interest, right? Like I have time to take advantage of compound interest. And if, if, if we were in a transaction where you said, hey, Todd, let me pay you 
$70,000 a year for a couple of years up to 490 k And by the time I'm 95, you give me $6 million. I would take that deal 10 times out of 10 because I can take the money that you've given me and over the next 70 years, invest it in other things and make way more money than $6 million. I mean, way more. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to give that to you. So th that's pretty much where I think we might just have like a fundamental difference, which is fine. Um, we can still be friendly. I'd still, hey. if we ever meet in person, I'd love to take you out for a beer someday and, and talk about it more. But it's just like, man, like when I see, when I see how the money can be allocated differently, it's really difficult for me to, to want to pony up $70,000 per year or half a million dollars, however you want to calculate it to uh -huh. get that policy when I could be investing in stocks, real estate, crypto. I mean, my crypto portfolio is up 300% this year. I know that's incredibly lucky. I know that's wild. I know I can't like <laughs> count on that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, again, you know, I mean, like I became a multimillionaire from investing. I didn't become a multimillionaire from buying insurance. So right. that's, I think that's where we just disagree. Gotcha, gotcha. So here's where the final uh, component that comes into my head where I think on a on an even bigger scale than just, me individually creating and amassing all this wealth so i love how you brought up how the insurance company the potential that that they can make that 386 million dollar number and this is where i i can't wrap my head i i i can't figure out why does major corporations uh high net worth families and banks why do they position a large portion not a little mickey mouse portion why do they why do they position a large portion of their money in whole life uh, or cash value life insurance and then they use that as an employee benefit compensation plan to their CFOs, CEOs and C-suite executives that's where i just i ponder and i'm like why are they doing that we're talking about the highest of the highest most profitable corporations in the world banks high net worth corporations and high net worth families, dynasty trust. So bank owned life insurance, corporate owned life insurance and trust owned life insurance. Why are they doing that? Uh, so that's like the first thing I, I wrestle with. And then the fact that you had brought up the whole $386 million of the insurance company, then the question I start to ask myself is, well, what if I gathered as a leader and found other leaders that lead other communities and we formed some kind of commonwealth structure that owns and operates under a faith-based organization of some type doesn't have to be a particular religion there's a difference between a religious structure and a faith-based organization there's a big difference between the two a faith-based organization operates under ecclesiastical law versus a religious organization operates under the U.S. tax code and the IRS, and they have exemptions, they have waivers versus a faith-based organization. They're completely tax accepted. So they never owe the tax to begin with, and they're able to operate uh, uh, very differently than uh, a religious organization. So with that in mind, I said, well, what if I'm able to pool together a community of people that kind of operate under one purpose unified and we acquire the insurance company and we acquire a bank and we use the insurance company and a, and a bank call it a non-financial banking institution right and i get i combine todd's wealth jennifer's wealth samantha's wealth and zell's wealth all the wealth of uh todd's community my community we we, we come together unified and we do exactly what they're doing. Um, and we ensure our members, and there's this unified purpose and message of, of building and preserving wealth on a magnitude that's unimaginable in most people's eyes. But it's so much that you and I are both solving that wealth gap together via the same exact structures that you and I both live under you know, under these different jurisdictions. So this is where I, I end up right here. So the, uh, the conversation and dialogue has been phenomenal and I've learned so much on how to conduct myself with my clients and whatnot. But then I end up, once I, you know, understand all these different opportunities, 
I still end up right here with the guys at the top between Boley, Coley, and Tolly and the insurance companies. And I still ask the question, why do they have it? And the rest of America doesn't. How did, how did they get the authority and, the, and the, amass the wealth to do that? Um, and that is the question, that's the fundamental that I'm trying to figure out. Because if I do figure it out, well then you and I could potentially solve the wealth gap you know, minorities, Hispanics, Blacks, all different creeds, races, religions that suffer from what? Lack of knowledge. People perish. Why? Because of lack of knowledge. And this is why, say, you know, uh, what, 80% now, probably. I, I definitely knew at one point it was 70. Uh, but I know that number has increased in terms of the amount of people that live paycheck to paycheck that don't have more than a thousand in their savings account, where an emergency over a thousand bucks could, you know, wipe out your average American family in the greatest country in the world, which is crazy, the wealthiest country in the world. And I end up right here and I say, okay, well, there's got to be a way to somehow combine what Todd's saying, what I'm saying to get the benefit of both under some kind of structure. And I call it a commonwealth where we can all benefit from the same structures that benefit from us, resulting in 386 million, right? I give my 490, they get 386 million over a 65, 70 year period. That's not bad at all. Times that by a million customers, we're in the, we're in the T, right? Trillion dollar mm -hmm. management and Mass Mutual is a prime example. I believe at this point they have a trillion dollars under management. And so they have an insurance company, they funnel that money through banks and corporations and they acquire small business. They leverage real estate. They just collect rent. They're doing everything that you and I are doing, but just on a huge magnitude. And I wonder if the people could do that as well. And that's where I end up right here. Um, and it's something for you to ponder on, uh, think on if I'm not sure if you ever thought that deep in terms of like, how do we solve, you know, wealth gap in equations and people living in poverty and people, you know, paycheck to paycheck. Like once you figured out for yourself, what's the natural thing you want to start teaching others, right? You, you're like, Hey man, I grew up in this environment. It was hell. And, uh, I don't want others to live that way. So therefore I'm going to create systems and frameworks that you could potentially live by and uh, decrease the, the time to financial independence. Like you said earlier, financial freedom, wealth preservation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, with that being said, that's kind of like where I'm at in terms of how I use these different structures, these different financial products, as you say, um, to not only achieve financial independence for myself, but potentially create some kind of framework, some type of pathway where others that have less could participate in that very structure and they don't have to go through the accreditation process. You know, that's another interesting thing about being inside of a faith-based organization type of a structure is you or I don't need to be accredited to acquire tier one assets, tier one real estate that produce double digit returns and then throw the tax, ex tax accepted status on top of that back to the bona fide participating members, AKA the people, the church, the body. And uh, we're in an interesting territory there. Uh, and so any, any thoughts there, any, any uh, questions um, as we you know, start to come to a close? Gotta say really thank you for diving this deep, spending nearly two hours with me. So uh, any, any questions, thoughts, how do you feel? No, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Wealth inequality is a problem. Um, there are people who ha have been historically disadvantaged and are disadvantaged today. Um, and my thing is education. I, I became a multimillionaire in my 20s. I teach everything I know for free. That's why I have a YouTube channel. I don't have a book to sell anyone. I don't have a course. I literally teach it all for free. Um, and actually, I think we met. We met because you saw a video that I did where I explained why I personally don't buy whole life insurance. And it's because of stuff like that, where it's like, I think people need to know that, hey, it's it's not that it's bad or evil or anything like that. Um, there's a place for it. It's that when you give a company 490 grand and you know in 70 years, they can give you $6 million back, just know that what they've been able to do with that 490 grand is potentially make upwards of 400 million. And I just want the people to know, why don't you make the 400 million instead, right? That's, that's what I'm about. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that um, there's different strategies, there's different techniques, there's no wrong or right answer. It's just, um, how do we help people 
to make the best decision for themselves. And I think it starts with exactly what you're doing is education. You have a channel teaching people financial literacy. I have a channel teaching people financial literacy. We may disagree on some things here and there, but at the end of the day, we're both trying to help people. And um, I think we're both doing a pretty good job at it. I think we are. Uh, I, I commend you. And just any any thoughts on the the bank owned, the corporate owned, and the and the trust owned life insurance? Any thoughts there as to like why they buy it, you know, and why they accumulate so much of it? You know, so I listened to a speech by Warren Buffett, um, who is arguably the greatest investor of all time, and his company Berkshire Hathaway owns a lot of insurance companies. Um, and he talked about his whole life strategy. He doesn't have a whole life policy on himself. Um, but he buys other people's whole life insurance policies. And what I mean by that is so basically, let's say that you have a whole life insurance policy and the um, the cash value is 200,000, right? So if someone wanted to surrender their policy, that's what the insurance company say, here, here's 200,000. Warren Buffett has historically gone to that person and say, hey, um, if you wanna get out of this life insurance policy, you'll get 200,000, you'll surrender it. How about I give you 250,000 and you just name me the beneficiary or you name my company Berkshire Hathaway the beneficiary perhaps the face value is a million or four million whatever it is right mm -hmm. so he's bought a lot of insurance policies that way um but basically what he's doing is he's buying you know he'll he'll, he'll be strategic about it he's is like hey this here's this man is 75 years old and he wants 200 grand and you know life expectancy in this country for men is like 78. <laughs> so Warren Buffett will say, here's this 250,000 and I'm going to get this death benefit of a million dollars in three years historically. So there's that component. As far as why other companies have whole life insurance as a big part of what they do, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, and, and who knows, like may, maybe I'll change my tune when I'm 70 years old. I, I, I really don't know. But all I know is that I just look at what's true right now and what's true today and what's the best use of my money. And so I I wouldn't like just like I wouldn't buy a timeshare because I don't think it's a good use of my money. Um, I wouldn't buy a brand new car because it depreciates over the first couple of years, right? It's just one of those things where there's nothing wrong with it. I just find that for me personally, for my situation, I could put money in other vehicles that do better for me. Got it, got it. Man, I'm blown away. Um, I hope the audience uh, when you guys watch this, once it goes live, um, please comment your questions, your thoughts, feedback. You can put articles, your perspectives, what you're doing. Are you anti? Are you, are you for it, pro it? Or are you kind of like in between? You don't, you don't hate it. You don't love it. You just don't own it. Kind of like, you know, like what Todd said. Um, and let's, you know, combine all of our thoughts and information to help us all make effective conscious financial decisions not just based off of what fear uh fear of missing out and not just based off hype someone as myself you know i like to always put myself on the hot seat and let people know hey don't just trust what i'm saying i want you to grow to trust me get to know like and trust me of course that's my intent as a business owner but i don't want that to cloud your own thinking as the viewer, I want you to poke holes in what I'm doing, kind of like what Todd did today. He definitely stunned me a couple of times. I was like, hmm, interesting, 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 you know, and still to the point where we can, like you said, we're, we're, we've, we've gotten along. We didn't throw no hate at each other. This video can be a prime example of how Republicans and, and uh, Democrats can, you know, come together and have a an ethical conversation. How do we help the people, dude? And doesn't have to be, you know, what what color te technically wins, red or blue, uh, but rather mm -hmm. do the people win? And so I really truly believe that the people won today. Uh, that your audience, my audience, uh, has won today and can make very very effective decisions. They know what to do, what not to do, and before they make a particular decision, especially something like investing, like you say, get educated for it. Don't just don't just buy any house and expect to do what Todd did. No, I mean, there's a whole process to that as to how he avoided taxes and how he strategically house hacked, you know, and collected rents. There's there's a whole process to that. And to eliminate the fear, just get educated on it so that you know, oh, well, there's this tax code that helps me get this. And if I rent it for this much and the mortgage is this at this interest rate, 
well, then it doesn't make sense for me to pay it off early, rather just have someone else pay it and I cash flow the difference, let it appreciate and depreciate the, through taxes at the same exact time, get phenomenal results. And then you're on to the next one, on to the next one, on to the next one, amassing a huge portfolio. And then maybe we can have discussions where we get into this section over here on how do we as citizens of the United States and many other countries, how do we come together and establish our own banking institutions, our own major corporations, our own trusts that allows us to operate outside of jurisdictions that have historically, say, oppressed people, depressed people, and many different facets that don't allow certain cultures, certain demographics to get to the next level because they have to do A, B, C, all the way to Z, one, two, three, all the way to infinity, just to get access to the information. I like that you are someone that you just, you know, you remind me of a couple by the name of uh, Layla and uh, Alex Harmozy. If you look them up, uh, they're actually a client of the agency that I'm partnered with. They're doing like hundred million dollars a year or so in revenue. And they literally have nothing to, like the guy comes on YouTube and he's like, hey, my name is Alex Harmozy. I got nothing to sell you. My whole mission is to help entrepreneurs create financial success. And here's how he does it. I think he sells books for like a penny or a dollar or something like that on Amazon. Um, he's got a course that's completely free, I think called acquisition.com. And he's just pushing out content, educating people. And I want to get to that level as well. You know, I want to be able to, I'm already there. I'm technically providing everything that I teach. I do it for free. And then I also charge for my time. That's really what people are paying for is really just my time. But I also teach it for free and I try to be as transparent as possible. I let people know, hey, you don't have to pay me a dime to learn this stuff. But if you're looking for that hand holding, that extra attention, time, focus, one to one, well, then there's some compensation that is involved with that. And, you know, always happy to uh, provide that transparency, give that honesty, and then get to a point where I can start like, you know, sponsoring people on a big scale, combining forces with people like you, Todd, and, and others to keep uh, pushing the, the flag closer and closer to that financial freedom place where others don't have to walk the treacherous path that you walk, that I'm walking. Um, they're still going to have obstacles because that's key, right? We, I, I'm sure you would agree that the things you went through builds character. Mm -hmm. But we're not saying that you need to grow up in a household where mom's beating up or dad's beating up mom, you know, mm -hmm. not that. But there are some healthy obstacles and challenges that builds character that needs to be there so that you know the value of this information like people charge thousands of dollars for what me and todd are doing right and more power to them but i understand where your heart where your mind is as with where mine is i you and i from the experience the conversations we've had so far you lead with a giving heart and that's my model as well i want to lead with a giving heart and unfortunately when we give for free what happens People take advantage of it and they don't use it, right? Mm -hmm. Versus like 95% or more of my clientele, when they paid me, they get dramatic more results than people that I've sponsored in my programs and courses for free and do nothing with it. Um, mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna stop just because the stats show that people don't value free. Um, mm -hmm. There's still that mom out there, that single mom, that single dad that, you know, a uh, person that went through hell and back that's going to take advantage and having this conversation uh, hopefully motivates someone, inspires someone to, to take that next actionable step and move forward. So as we close things out, Todd, please give us the name of your YouTube channel again, um, other social medias where we can find you. Um, how do we, how the best way to, you know, get in touch with you, communicate with you, things like that. Absolutely. So my YouTube channel is just my name, Todd Baldwin. If you just type into YouTube, you will find me. The best way to get in contact with me is on Instagram and my handle is at Todd J Baldwin. So Todd Baldwin for YouTube, at Todd J Baldwin for Instagram. Awesome. Thank you. And as you guys already know, and if you don't know, my name is Denzel Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. It has been an honor 
and privilege to serve you, the community. And it's been an honor and a privilege to be in your presence, Todd. Thank you very much. God bless everyone. Have a wonderful day and we'll be talking soon.